it. There we go. You can find us on um, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, where all of you can also um, browse past events if you ever feel like that. So uh, let me start by saying that I'm Dorothea von Mertke. I'm one of the owners of Labyrinth Books. Um, I'm so thrilled that you're all here. Thanks for your patience um, coming here via the other site. And uh, I will uh, step aside soon. I just want to start with some quick thanks uh, to both Sean Wolens, whom you see here, uh, but also to Nigel Smith, who is, um, I don't know if he's in the audience, uh, the two of them really put the book that we're here to honor and to discuss on my radar, and I'm going to hold it up because if we were in the bookstore, there would be a big pile of these now. So Jonathan Tappan's The Magic Years, um, Scenes from a Rock and Roll Life. Uh, and before we, we turn to that book, just a couple quick housekeeping things. The most important of which is, uh, and most of you know this, please find the Q&A button that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you want to ask a question and we encourage you to just put your questions in there as they come to you um, and and we will make sure to leave time to answer them. And the other thing I want to um, point out is that, of course, you can find um, Jonathan's book at labyrinthbooks.com. I encourage you to buy it. And if you enter um, if you enter Taplin uh, at checkout, then you'll get 10% off your entire order. But if you'd rather one of our booksellers help you directly, simply send a note to orders.labyrinth at gmail.com and um, we'll take it from there. So either way, I hope you, you get a book into your hands. And if you are signing in from somewhere far away, um, and we're looking for the book, find the independent bookstore that is nearest and dearest to your heart and support them. Um, we all uh, rely on your support. So there is a kind of uh, built-in conundrum when you want to introduce an author of a memoir, which is that um, in an introduction like that, it can feel like you all you can do is a sort of uh, reductive preempting of what the conversation then is all about, which is the life of the author. Um, and in the case of Jonathan Taplin, it can actually all sound very quickly, just like so much name dropping. Um, so suffice it to say that Jonathan has had an exceptional life and career, which tracks with so many bright moments in the recent music and film history um, of this country, uh, but also um, in, in our tech era. And there really have been uh, some so much magic at work, it seems, um, that the title makes good on its promise. But magic, yes, certainly, but also for sure no less the force of Jonathan's person that personality, um, which is how he got to be road manager for Bob Dylan and the band, produced Scorsese's Mean Streets, among many other films, became an, an entrepreneur, became professor eventually, uh, now emeritus, at the Annenberg School of Communication, and wrote uh, an important book called Move Fast and Break Things, how Facebook Google and Amazon have cornered culture and undermined democracy, a book that feels extremely relevant right now if we look at the news. So I'm so glad that we all now get to meet him in this virtual space. Um, I'm extra glad that we have with us as our guide through this conversation, Sean Wilentz, who many of you know uh, as the acclaimed historian of the American Revolutionary Era, the author of many influential books about that epoch. But he is here today as a longtime friend of Jonathan's and wearing his hat instead of um, his other hat of music critic and also author of, of course, Bob Dylan in America. So with that, I'm going to bow out and uh, let you two take it away. Uh, warm welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thank you, Dorothea. And uh, hello to everyone out there in, in cyberspace. Tap, it's great to be back with you again. Uh, all the way out there in LA. Um, you know, we're just going to chat for, for 45 minutes or so and talk about a bunch of things. Um, first, I, I mean, welcome back to Princeton, basically, first of all. I mean, you yes. will know from, from the very beginning that, that, that Jonathan Daplin's an old Princeton boy, the class of 69, is that right? That's correct. The class of 69. So this is, not, this is his, you know, a pre-reunion reunions uh, session, <laughs> among other things. And we'll talk about that in a sec. 
But I did want to ask you, actually, I never asked you this question, John. We've talked about the book. I, I got the chance to read this book in, um, in galleys very early on and uh, was thrilled with it then and I'm thrilled with it now. And I hope you'll be thrilled with it as well. But I'd never asked you the title, the title. I mean, it's a way, there are many ways you can understand what that title means. Because the obvious thing, you're writing about the late 60s into the 70s. Many of us consider those magical years. But I think you probably had, you know, deeper associations with that. Is that right? I mean, wh why that title? Well, uh, I, I think in some ways it's a little bit of a contrast from uh, a, a more dystopian culture. Uh, in other words, I, I really felt like the early 60s, um, and because you've written so much about Bob, you is more of an expert than me in the sense that the culture was very aspirational. Uh, you know, we shall overcome. The times they are a changing. Uh, the answer is blowing in the wind. And, and so in that sense, it felt very magical in the sense that the politics and the culture were married in a really special way. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, there was a long piece in the New York Times Magazine this weekend, last weekend about the Sopranos and how the Sopranos is now seen by the younger generation as a particular kind of end of times kind of retrospective on America in decline. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the culture today, and if, if you think that maybe music is not quite as powerful as it was in the 60s, certainly television is much more powerful than it was. And if you think about post 9-11 television where you would start with The Sopranos and then maybe go to Mad Men and then Breaking Bad and Succession. And all of these are basically anti-hero dramas in which you, your protagonist is a terrible, corrupt, right. murderous person. Right, right. right. And is fighting in a terrible, corrupt, murderous world. Right. And, and to me, that's not very magical. Right. You know? right. I mean, and, and it's not very inspiring. And, and maybe even in the worst case, you come to believe so much that this is the way the world is that then in 2016, you say, well, why not get Tony Soprano to be president? <laughs> Yeah, right, 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 right. We need someone that, to kick ass and take names. And, that, and that, that would have been an improvement, in my opinion. That would have been an improvement, in my opinion. But, <laughs> but um, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, not only aspirational, but affirmative. I mean, is, 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 we will, will, will. Right. It was going to happen. And a lot of it did happen. Um, yeah. um, but then it was all undercut. And you have, the year 1965 is crucial in this book. And I think that's the crucial turning point of what we're talking about, actually, 9/11, yes, all of that's true. But something happened in that year where the where things flipped, and it actually began with the Kennedy assassination. So, uh, the the undoing of the era is is there present even when the year is beginning. I mean, right. it's a it's a dialectic in that sense. Um, all right, but look, let's get back to Princeton. I, that makes a lot of sense. So, I had thought that you got hooked up with all of this while you were an undergraduate, but in fact, this all started bef the summer before you became an undergraduate. Is that right. right? Why don't you tell us that story? So I was a big Dylan fan, you know, and I'd gone, I went to prep school in Massachusetts and I, I had seen him in Boston at, at Symphony Hall in 64, in the early 64. And, um, so I was just determined that I wanted to go see him at the Newport Folk Festival in July of 1965. And my brother was very close to a guy named Paul Clayton, who was an ethnomusicologist, who was a friend of Bob's. And, and Bob had actually spent some time with Paul in, in 62 and 63. Paul had gone on one of those classic, you know, Kerouacian road trips with Gino Foreman and some of those other characters. And, and so 
Paul got me a backstage pass at Newport. And then he introduced me to a guy named Jeff Mulder, who actually has Princeton collection. I was going to say another Prince. Princeton had a lot to do with the making of this entire culture. Right. right. Yes, go ahead. And, and Jeff Mulder was in a band called the Jim Kweskin Chug Band. And it just so happened they needed a roadie for the weekend. Someone to haul the jugs and the washed up basses and the banjos around from stage to stage. And so I said, oh, I'd love to do that. And so Jeff took me over and introduced me to a gentleman named Albert Grossman. And Albert Grossman was at that time the manager of most of the important people in the folk music business, certainly Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, but also Paul Butterfield and, you know, Odetta and many important artists. And a lot of them were there in Newport at that time. And so Albert said, I'll pay you 200 bucks for the weekend. And so I was on. And so then I was in the club, so to speak. And so, uh that Saturday, well, first, uh, yeah, on Saturday, Jeff and I were watching a workshop, uh, which was put on by Alan Lomax. And it was Sunhouse, Mississippi John Hurt, and Skip James. And these are all 70-year-old Black blues men playing their stuff, and Alan Lomax was kind of being the moderator. And about 100 yards down the field, you hear this wail, and it's Paul Butterfield's harmonica, and they're tuning up, and Mike Bloomfield's tuning up, and Alan Lomax just gets a hair up his butt and decides to go over there and tell them to stop because it's interrupting. You can hear... The, their noise from his workshop. And he goes over there and he literally tries to unplug Mike Bloomfield's amplifier. And Albert grabs him by the shirt and pulls him down and they kind of wrestle for a bit. And then Lomax slinks back. And, and so Jeff Moldar and I go back to the artist tent and Moldar starts telling all the Grossman artists his tale of of Albert beating up Alan Lomax and defending Paul Butterfield. <laughs> and Bob was there and I saw Bob grin. And I don't know, if, and maybe you know, but I think he just decided on the spur of the moment that he would go play electric. If it was that big a pain in the ass to Alan Lomax, <laughs> he'd be a big pain by doing it on stage Sunday night as the closing act. <laughs> right. And so, they just quickly organized a band. I mean, they got Butterfield's rhythm section, which is Sandley and Jerome Arnold, and Mike Bloomfield had played on Like a Rolling Stone. So he was in there. And then they brought Al Cooper in from New York on a private plane to play organ. And it was literally thrown together in, in two hours. I think they may have rehearsed for an hour that night, Saturday night. And they did a sound check Sunday afternoon, which I was there at, which was chaotic. And Peter Yarrow was somehow given the job of being a sound mixer and organizing the whole thing. And it was, Bob didn't really want to rehearse. And, you know, I remember classically seeing Jerome Arnold look at the back of his bass and he'd written like notations, like how Maggie's farm works, you know, right. because it was the opposite of 12 bar blues. Right. It was like two chords right. for, forever. And then right. it right. 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 and you never, you didn't, and he was just like, so that night they played, it was not that good. No, I was going to say they should have rehearsed more. It was not well rehearsed. It no. was not together. And Bloomfield, knowing it was not rehearsed, kept turning up his guitar right, right. louder and louder. And so out in the audience, all you could hear was Bloomfield's guitar screaming. And, and Peter Yarrow didn't know how to mix rock and roll. And it was a complete mess. And after the first tune, there was just like silence. And then some booze. And like, you know, Bob Dylan was the great hero 
<laughs> and I don't think they'd ever heard. He'd never been booed in his life. No. And well, it may be inhibiting, but not not since. Right. No. Right. And and then Bob jumped into like a Rolling Stone, and then they did that, and then they did another song, and and the booze kept coming, and. After three songs, Bob said to Bloomfield, let's split. And, and, you know, they, we had been told he was going to play seven songs. And so he just left after three songs. And then the audience went silent and people were yelling at each other. Oh, look what you did, asshole. He's left. And, and Peter Yarrow runs backstage and I follow him backstage. And Bob's sitting on the bottom steps of this very high stage and just, just sitting there and Peter runs up onto the stage and says let's get Bobby back on stage show him that you love him and everything and Bob wasn't moving and then Peter would come to the top of the set said come on Bobby play him one song please and nothing and then Johnny Cash came out of the tent and had an acoustic guitar and he walked up to him and he said play them a song son and, you know, I, you know and, and Bob took the guitar and kind of went upstairs, up to the steps. And when he got to the top of the steps, Chipmunk, the lighting guy, put one single spotlight on him. And then there was Bob with an acoustic guitar. And as far as the Newport audience was concerned, they won, right? He's now going back to playing folk music. And... So he goes and he says, did anybody have a D harmonica? And the people start throwing harmonicas onto the stage and he puts one up and he sings, it's all over now, baby blue. And then he quickly goes through Mr. Chamberlain and then he walks up the stage again. And that was like, whoa. And to me, you know, it was such a statement because it was like, screw you. I mean, I, I'm going to do what I want to do. And but they didn't like it at all. And it was to me, so that was, that was my summer <laughs> before Christmas. And, and so Albert said to me, well, look, if you want to work for the jug band on weekends, because I mostly book them on college concerts, uh, you can do that. And so I would come to New York and we'd go, fly to a college concert on Saturday, on Friday night, and we do one on Saturday night, and then I'd come back to New York on Sunday. So for three years, I did that. I did it for Questkin. I did it for Judy Collins. I did it some for Janice Joplin. And, and, and then eventually the band decided they wanted to be a band and play. And, and that was my senior year. And I kind of skipped out. I, I convinced Alan Downer, the head of the English department, to let me make a film for my thesis. <laughs> it was a total scam. And he went for it. Right, right. And so I, I made a film while I was on the road. And it was well, you, Tap, you've answered my question, though, was how, how you managed to get a Princeton degree by, I mean, look, you know, if it was me, I never would have gone back to school, right? I would have been surrounded by all of this celebrity, all of this greatness, all of this genius, you know, I mean, Bob right. Dylan, you're not sure, but I mean, you know, everything else, and, you know, let alone, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I mean, I never would have come back. So I think that you showed remarkable, you know, tenacity as, a, as an intellectual and a student to actually do that. Well, I had the best of both worlds in, in the sense that, you know, Princeton in 1967 was still an all-male institution. So the social life on a Friday night in 1967, and in those days it was Friday night, it wasn't Thursday night, right. was pretty grim. It was a lot of, you know, two inches of beer on the floor of Colonial Club. <laughs> right, right. Right. And, and so the choice between that and going out on oh, well, the sure. tour but, but, but with the, these... But my question, Tap, is why you ever came back. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, this, my this father, is... father, I had <laughs> promised him I would get a medicine degree. I don't know what, what the hell. But I, and you had, a, and you had a, you had a radio show, too, didn't you? Weren't you a PRB yeah, guy? I, was, I had a Sunday night radio show on WPRB uh, and played... 
you know, very eclectic stuff, everything from jazz to Tim Harden to Bob Dylan, you know, and, and Albert would, he would slip me records a little early, you know, uh -huh. which was cool. I mean, I, I had an advanced copy of Blonde on Bond. Oh, wow. Really? That, that was one of the most amazing records that's ever been made as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Well, I agree with that, but I mean, you were ahead of the curve. You were probably the first person to put that on the radio. I mean, yeah. think about yeah. it, right? Yeah. No one else was doing yeah. it. But, okay. So, all right. But then we move into, you did a lot of stuff with Bob. You do the Isle of Wight. You do all of this stuff, but you wrote, your closest connection is to, is, to, is to Robbie and the band. And why don't you, I mean, you did that segue through all the other acts, but the band is where, where you really ended up. So right. why, don't we, why don't you talk about that part of the story? So, to me, you know, I first began to encounter the band when they came down with Bob to do a tribute to Woody Guthrie. Right. Woody Guthrie had died, and I was temporarily working for Judy Collins, who was managed by Harold Leventhal, who was an old lefty, managed Pete Seeger, everything else. And Harold put together this concert to as a tribute for Woody and to benefit for Huntington's career, which was this disease that he died of. And Albert was pissed off because Albert, <laughs> the Harold had somehow gotten to Bob and Bob had agreed to come and be on the show. And Albert hadn't been able to get Bob to do anything other than make some demo tapes for songs. So, <clears throat> He came down with this group called the Hawks, and I had seen them maybe four or five times in the 65, 66 time when they were Bob's backing band. And they came down and they just ripped it up. It was so wonderful. They played, you know, three of Woody's songs and it was just marvelous. And when it was all over, Robbie said to me, look, uh, we we recorded this album called Music from Big Pink, and we're going to go out on tour. So would you like to be our tour manager? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> and so then about five weeks later, Rick Danko drove his car off the road, drunk one night, and broke his neck. And so the tour never happened. And, you know, on some way for the band it actually turned out better because they became this mysterious group that nobody had ever seen other than this one day at, at Carnegie Hall and so uh, so then the band Robbie said okay we're gonna go make an album in February but we don't want to do it in Woodstock it's too damn cold so we're going to go to California. And would you help us go set that up? So I went out to LA and, and I found a house owned by Sammy Davis Jr. And we rented this house and it had a big pool house. And we basically made it into a um, recording studio. And another Princetonian named John Simon was the recording engineer slash producer and that was the Brown album, the second band album. And so I set it all up and we, we got it all going. And then I went back and finished some classes. I had to do some things at Princeton. And then I came back in May and the band had finished that album and we were going to play Winterland, right. which was, you know, if you think about it, the very first concert a group ever plays is three nights at Winterland. That's pretty amazing. Right? Remind people, remind people, John, what Winterland was. Okay, so Winterland was this huge barn of a room that Bill Graham had renovated, and it had it seated eight thousand people, so it was a big room, and so they had sold out three nights for you know, which was for a debut concert was amazing. So we go up to San Francisco and um, Robbie 
we go to the hotel and Robbie says, oh man, I got a fever, it's weird. And so we say, okay, well, you just go lie down and go to bed and we'll go do the sound check without you. And we come back and he's like throwing up and he's just like in delirium. And then the next day, <clears throat> which is the day of the first concert, Thursday, he's still like 104 temperature and everything. And, and Albert Grossman flies in from New York and he says, I don't want to cancel this. This is too important. And Robbie said, well, I, I can't even stand up. And so literally we keep pushing off. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Bill Graham shows up and says, what the hell is going on here? And, and, and Albert says, well, he's really sick. And Bill Graham says, well, look, I've got this hypnotist. And, uh, you know, sometimes maybe he's just got stage fright. And so Albert says, okay, bring in the hypnotist. So they literally bring a hypnotist in. And he puts Robbie in a trance and somehow manages to get Robbie up and operating and saying it can play and it's it's like a miracle we're sitting in the room watching it and so the hypnotist has given him this post hypnotic suggestion that the, whenever he heard the word grow he would feel all these strong feelings in his body and feel like he could take on the world so the hypnotist sits in the limo with me on our way to the Winterland, and he says, okay, I just need to be in sight line of Robbie. And so I put him behind the speaker and give him some cotton to put in his ears. And Richard Manuel is sitting much closer to the hypnotist than Robbie is because Richard's at the piano. And Robbie plays the concert as if he's on autopilot. And when we come off the stage, <laughs> Robbie says to Richard, we're in the limousine later. He says, God, that was the weirdest thing. Between every song, the guy was just yelling, grow in my <laughs> ear. And Richard said, I never heard a word. You know? <laughs> Come out of here. This is kind of on some wavelength. Of anyway, so that was it. And so then we, you know, we played and we went to Woodstock. And then, then, then Bob got this incredible offer of a huge amount of money to go to the Isle of Wight with the band. And right, so then we right. then that's that and that's the beginning of a big, big big story. Time. Big big story in the book. But uh, I was thinking two things as you were talking, John. Actually that out in California. Now California really was the refuge. I mean Dylan was starting off in Newport and getting booed, but he comes out to Berkeley and then he comes to LA and there everybody gets it. Everybody was okay. saying what were you waiting for? Totally. Same kind of thing with a lot of these bands from the East. When they got out to California, the turn really occurred, I think, in a way that, that it hadn't before. So I, my feeling is that, that the folk music culture that was so defensive, which was around Irwin Silber and- the it's, all the, it's all the Communist Party, basically. I mean, right, it was all that right. left-wing stuff. It's very right. East Coast, right. New York thing. Right. And, and they felt- that Bob had betrayed them. Correct, right. By not staying with protest music and all of that. They thought he was Woody Guthrie and he didn't want to be that. He wanted to transcend Exactly. exactly. And, and you know, Bob had, Bob had gone to England and had, was hanging out with John Lennon. Right. And I always thought that Bob changed John Lennon a lot. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about the distance from I want to hold your hand to Norwegian wood, which right. is only like 16 months. Right. That's Bob in the middle of that. Yes. Bob teaches John Lennon a different way of thinking about writing songs. But I also think that John Lennon changed Bob. Absolutely. You know, in a, in the sense of, hey man, you can have fun. This rock and roll thing is is kind of cool, and mm -hmm. and you can really have a blast. And mm -hmm. and you know. You know, just in terms of style, Bob went to England in blue jeans and work shirts and comes back in 
tight pants and high heeled boots right, and right, right, shirts right, and black leather right, jacket. Right, you know, right, right, right. Like a right, totally right, different guy. Right, 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 right. Well, and okay. Um, but one sad part of all of this, though, and because you, I, you know, as you were listing, you know, mentioning the names, right? I mean, you know, Richard Manuel, Rick Danko, right. Right. Um, you know, uh, someone said, maybe it was Griel who said, you know, you look on the cover of your book and everybody is dead within five, 10 years. Right. Um, the drug, and, and, and you tell the stories in the book very eloquently, very, very straight about drugs and about you know, heroin in particular and the toll that it took. Uh, on the magic years and you know if there were there were lots of things that undid the magic years but one of them was drugs yeah yeah totally i mean two things happened i think that changed that upset the magic years the first thing was you know 68 politically the assassinations of martin luther king and bobby kennedy just completely said okay if politics and music were all married together up to 68, in 68, it's like, well, shit, politics is just going to break your heart. Yeah. And, and screw that. I'm just going to go join the rock and roll circus and, and think about that. And, and so that was the first thing. By 71, and, and really in, in the late 60s, there was a lot of pot, but there was no white powders of any kind. I mean, maybe, you know, during the 66 tour, there was some amphetamine, but amphetamine, right. basically you take a pill, a dexedrine to go up on stage, you know, it was like that. Right. But somehow in the early 70s, the heroin culture sneaked in and you know, I mean, if you think about that picture in, in the cover of my book, that's a train trip in 1970 in the summer. And it's we're riding across Canada on this Trans-Canadian Express. And, and there's Janis Joplin, there's Rick Danko, there's Jerry Garcia, there's the guy from the New Riders of the Purple Sage. And, and they're within five seven years they were all dead and and that's kind of a sad note because in in the sense that somehow this notion that unlike the reincarnation of billy holiday i mean janice joplin as much as people tried to talk to her and get her to go straight she really thought somehow that that was part of what made her a blues singer right and i i you know i had other experiences with eric clapton and and keith richards uh in the early 70s and they had that same weird illusion mm -hmm. that the blues had something to do with being like billy holiday or mm -hmm. or you know like you know, bird yeah and yeah. and it it just it just killed them you yeah. know and, and it's so sad because they they were all kind of good spirit you know janice on that trip janice was straight for about two or three months and but she liked to drink a lot mm -hmm. and on the, on the course of that trip soon after that picture is taken um the dead ran out of pot and so janice suggested they try her libation of choice which was this drink called southern, southern comfort, comfort. Which, yeah. which is a really <laughs> <laughs> you know there were some of us who wanted to be really hip but we started drinking southern comfort back in those days and that put me right off the whole bit you know no, forget it's, it. it's really bad ugly drink and so uh she, she, David and Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir started drinking it. And the next thing you know, they drunk up all of her Southern comfort and she was pissed <laughs> off. What the road hell? to excess. She made, yes, us, yes. she made us stop the train in this nowheresville Indian village in the middle on the way to Calgary. 
and John Cook and I were, John was Alistair Cook's son, and he was her road manager, and I was the band's road manager. And we took up a collection, and we got off the train, and we found the only liquor store in town, and we put the $500 down on the counter, and we said to the guy, tell us when we spent it all. <laughs> and fortunately, the local Indians like Southern Comfort, too. <laughs> They, they had Southern Comfort and Jack Daniels and a lot of beer. So there you go. We were, we were here. <laughs> well, okay. So, but tap. But this is a period when you make your switch too, though. I mean, this is when you move from 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 rock and roll into the movies and and yeah. and hook up with with Morning Scorsese. Because, movies, so, you know, I mean, it, how did that happen, though? Well, it was it was it got so it was not fun to be on the road, you know. And I, you know, I tell the story of Levon trying to get Levon up to go to Chicago one morning and he, and he, in his underwear, he chases me around the room with a Bowie knife. You know, he just was not interested in going to Chicago. And I thought, well, this is not a life. <laughs> yeah. This is no way to make a living. Right. 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 And after Bangladesh, after I, you know, I produced the concert for Bangladesh for George Harrison. And after that, I realized that Bob wasn't interested in going on the road. The band was hardly working at all. And, you know, Eric Clapton was too sick to, to go on the road. And George Harrison didn't want to go on the road because it was too much hassle. And so I thought, I'll go to California and see what's happening. And there was this guy named Jay Cox, who was a writer for Time magazine. He'd written a cover story on the band for Time. Right. He said, well, when you go out there, look up my friend, Marty Scorsese. He edited Woodstock, and he's a film editor, and he loves rock and roll, and he, you, will, you will enjoy him a lot. So I was so naive that Marty came to my house, and he brought this script called Season of the Witch, which eventually became Mean Street. Mean Street right. And I just didn't know that you weren't supposed to spend your own money on movies, you know? There's a phrase out here called OPM, other people's money. Right. But nobody told me about OPM. And so somehow he said, I think I can make it for half a million dollars. And I put in 250 and I got a good friend to put in 250 and, and we made it. And thank God made a great movie and we got our money back. You know, and I I still make money on that movie. <laughs> later, you know, right, right. So, I mean, it it was it was just naivete though, Sean. It was yeah. not conscious in the sense of I didn't. I had this weird thought that, well, when you do a rock and roll show, and if something goes wrong, you're screwed because there's ten thousand people clapping to start the show. Right. But if you do a movie. And something goes wrong, you say, okay, everybody go home, we'll come back tomorrow. And and so somehow I thought I could do it. And mm -hmm. it turned out okay. It worked mm -hmm. out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot in the book about all of that. And I don't want to, and I'm glad you changed the name of the title, by the way. The Season of the Witch was nowhere near as good as the no. <laughs> but, um, but look, but you, but one of the things that's extraordinary about your life, John, is that there have been so many of them. I mean, and, and you know, the cliche would be, you know, that 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 you're sort of a zealot figure, except you're not a zealot figure at all. You're a zealot figure actually did things and made a difference, and uh, you were everywhere what you wanted to be. But in fact, you were getting things going. So, but looking back on all of this, and as you were the Annenberg, you know, at the Annenberg School there, um, and you're still, you know, after 1973, you went out to LA, and you're still there. So you've seen a lot of what's gone on in terms of the transformation of our culture and particularly the rise, and you've written about this much more recently, the rise, and this is beyond the book, but the rise of what we want to call it, you know, digital dystopia. Maybe that's the word for it. Right. And, um, you know, why don't you say, you know, in wrapping up before we turn to questions, why don't you say a few words about, you know, your thoughts about where we are today, vis-a-vis um, -vis music, um, movies for that matter, and just the culture under this new regime. Right. Well, I mean, First off, if anybody has any questions, put them into the Q&A thing. Um, second thing, I would say the following. I think we live in 
Mark Zuckerberg's world. I, I, I really think, you know, I wrote this book called Move Fast and Break Things. And, and the subtitle was how Facebook, Google, and Amazon cornered culture and undermined democracy. And, and the English publisher of the book said to me, well, you can't say it undermines democracy. You know, this, now this was in 2016. So, you know, it was very early on in that. And, and eventually, I just said, no, you have to use that title. And, and so he relented and, and he's happy that he did. But the point was that I don't think I had any idea how bad it was going to get. Because, and I think, you know, what, what we heard last week from this whistleblower is really germane in the sense that these companies have only one imperative, which is to keep people on their service as long as possible. And they learned early on that the things that kept people on their service were what made them angry. The angrier they were, the longer they stayed on and sent stuff to their friends and forwarded stuff and you know, and, and, and so they became this machine that, for one thing, it made it easy for you to find people who thought like you did, even if you were just completely bonkers, right? Right, right. right, right. If, if, if you believe that the vaccination is Bill Gates' way of, of embedding a microchip in your arm, on Facebook, you can find a million people who actually will say, right on, man. I mean, so that's pretty scary. But the other thing it does is that it's really good for getting those people to fight other people because you can easily find people who think you're fucking crazy because you're refusing to get a vaccine and you're making everybody else sick. And, and so it's easy for you to find people to fight right. and, and get your little gang together and go have a battle. And so to my mind, it's super dangerous. And it's very clear to me that despite what they said, they are not really interested in moderating the worst sides of humanity. Uh, and, and they know, you know, and, and put aside like the Rohingya stuff and all the other stuff they've been doing all over the world to cause conflict and anger. Just what they're doing in the United States. I mean, quite honestly, if Facebook had been around in 1954, we'd still have polio. You know? <laughs> right. right. You know? And so, I mean, I, I just don't know exactly... Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. I mean, so the second thing is that I'm not sure that streaming music is that great for artists. In other words, when I was working in the music business in the early 70s, um, there was a thing called a Pareto curve, which is a, a economic theory, which is otherwise known as the 80-20 rule, that a record company or a movie company would make 80% of its revenues off 20% of its product. And so, you know, I mean, in some ways, that's kind of obvious. And you know, probably when the first Bob Dylan album came out, which I think sold 4,000 copies. Something like that, yeah, yeah, if that. Mm -hmm. Mitch Miller, who was running Columbia Records, didn't mind because he had Mitch Miller and the sing-along people that sold a million copies. Right. right. So he was fine supporting a guy who only sold. Right. Right. Today, I mean, when I last looked on, on the streaming numbers, 90% of the revenue went to about 2% of the artists. Now. Right. 
So it's not the 80-20 rule. It's, it's a world in which Beyonce and Taylor you know, Swift Taylor Swift do yeah. really, really well. And the average artist doesn't make much money at all off of it. Right. And, you know, there's supposedly on Spotify, there's 2 million tunes have been watched or listened to less than three or four times. Really? Which would tell you that if you if you're a writer and you can't get your mother and your girlfriend and your best friend to listen to you, you're in pretty sad shape, you know? So, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's helping. Now, here's the other thing that's gonna happen, is the movie business is about to go through somewhat of a crash scenario. Right. So let's just take the new James Bond movie. They spent $250 million to make that movie. And then they spent another $100 million to advertise. So it made last weekend $70 million at the box office, of which the theaters take half of that. So now <laughs> they've got $35 million in against their $400 million. They're stuck. Yeah, they're you, stuck. you can't. That's not going to work stuck. out financially. It's a disaster. Right. And, and so, and, and you know, I mean, from Marty Scorsese's point of view, and he got so much flack for saying this, this whole Marvel universe, that's not movies. Well, that's not that's movies. No, that's right. That's right. That's and right. if that's all we're going to have, um, forget it. You know, so I, I, I don't, I'm, and you're not in a good mood, John. <laughs> well, look, I'm worried about the culture. I, I really am. I am mean, too, right. But let's, uh, let's open it up to questions. Yeah, I was okay. just going to say, so there's a variety of questions in the queue, and maybe we'll start with one that is also worried about the current moment uh, on behalf of, of her children, and is asking, what are your recommendations for college-trained young people who are under 30, who are in the arts and in sound engineering, um, um, and in the classical and performance art management. So these are her children. This is Susan Connolly, um, and who are principled uh, people and who want to live a kind of quality of life that, that has some stability. Uh, and this is these are their passions. Uh, so she's asking for recommendations. Well, look, it, it's tough. You know, first off, my son is a recording engineer. And, and, you know, it's, it's hard because every band thinks that if they have a, a Macintosh and Pro Tools, they can record themselves, you know? I mean, if they're at that level of just getting started. So um, I, don't, I don't mean to be uh, down on it, but I, I do think it's, it's a hard, way to go in terms of recording engineer. Now, whether you can make a living as an artist is uh, an open situation. Now, there's all sorts of new ways of trying to, you know, get a Patreon account or get, you get people to support you just because they like you. And it's, it is kind of a patronage model. And maybe that's the way it works out. You know, if you can find yourself a patron, that, you know, kind of like the Renaissance artists used to right. live. Right. You know, maybe that's what we have to go back to. You know, I, 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 I'm not positive that the, the commercial world works. Although I must say my daughter, Daniela is a, a film producer and she did a film last year called Harriet about Harriet Tobman. And, and you know, it was a very hard film to get finance and mounted, but it actually worked out well in the end. So it's not like there's nothing there. And, and sometimes when you see the, the films that come out at the Academy Awards, um, they may not do that well at the box office, but they're still making, people are somehow managing to make some quality movies, you know. Um, how long that will go on, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll go to a Dylan question, since uh, we've been talking about Dylan a bunch too. This comes from Richard Smith. Um, 
who is wondering, have we been maybe asking for years the wrong question about Bob Dylan? That is, why did Dylan go electric in 1965? But Dylan had been a rock and roller as a teenager. So maybe we should seriously ask, why did Dylan go acoustic? That his intensive acoustic folk roots music period between 60 and 65 is the true anomaly of the overall career of this talented and versatile musician. I, you know, I'd love Sean to ch chime in on this, but my comment is that's probably a pretty interesting notion, which was, if you were a solo artist in 1961 or 62, probably the easiest way to, to get heard would be to go to Gerd's Folk City with a guitar and you didn't have to support a band or do anything. And maybe, maybe you could get heard, you know, whereas... You know, I mean, if you think about who was successful, and I think Bob actually played piano for Bobby V once, uh, uh, you know, Bobby Rydell and, and the kind of stuff that was successful in the early 60s was not <laughs> art. Well, yeah, Bobby <laughs> said this, Bobby said this. He said rock and roll got really bad and it became Fabian and it became Frankie Avalon and it became that. That was part of it that rock and roll had lost its way and or became taken over by this you know dreck but right. two i mean dinky town mattered and there was this this sort of you know spin-off of the beats the beats had two spin-offs one was jazz but the other was folk music and that was if you were a college kid in 1959 60 that was where you were going to be and then of course all you needed was a guitar so you didn't have to hook up with bobby v and do all that stuff right but you're I, I think richard's absolutely right i mean i think that his heart was always in rock and roll. His heart was always in Buddy Holly. And there was this detour, as he's described it. It wasn't that he didn't like it and he learned a lot. I mean, you know, he, you couldn't become Bob Dylan without all of that stuff, including Paul Clayton. But, 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 but then he, then he managed the synthesis. And that's what's so extraordinary about 1965 in my view. Yeah. You know, go ahead. No, no, go John, ahead. There's, another, there's another incident, which I've always wondered about. There's a famous point where Bob is given an award by the Emergency Civil Liberties right. Union um, thing, and he and he shows up kind of drunk, right. and it's literally right after John Kennedy had gotten killed. Right. right. And he's on that stage with James Baldwin, right. and he gives a talk, and he somehow says something about Oswald that he could right. he could see some of himself. He could see some of himself in Lee Harvey Oswald. He wouldn't go that far, but he could see some of himself. Right, right. And and he got, there was a time he got booed, right? Yeah. Right. And, but someone said to me, well, I think Bob was a little scared when JFK got killed. Mm. But if you're a a spokesperson or a leader for supposedly a change generation, mm -hmm. new generation. Yeah, You're also right. a target. Right. And and he probably saw enough crazy people trying to get backstage mm -hmm. in the early 60s mm -hmm. to begin to worry a little bit about whether that that was a good place to be too. I don't know. Well, it's funny because Phil Oaks would say this exactly about two years later about Dylan, that he was scared. And when, when Dylan's tour in 65 went to Dallas, that's when Al Cooper said, I'm not going because you saw what they did to, to Kennedy in Dallas. So, but this is two years later. It's true. That speech is about, you know, how he sided. He didn't like the old folks in the audience. They were all old, basically cp right. type lefties, old, old lefties, but, you know, from, the, from the, 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 the party side. He didn't like any of that. He was with SNCC. He was with the kids at Vince Ramos Brigade. Right. He was with youth. He wanted to be youth. Right. The thing about that story was, though, I think, that he was depressed by Kennedy's death, as the entire country was. Traumatized right. until the Beatles come later on, which he talks about in his last album. Right. That December, and this is where my story comes in, that December, he met Allen Ginsberg in my uncle's apartment. And everything changed. Wow. That's my view of it all. That something fundamental, something was re he found, he got back to the beats as he had been in, 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 right. in, in as a kid. And then his music, he opens Dylan's breath, a lot changes then. But it came out of the trauma of November, December 63. Right, right. 
So we have but Richard, it's a great question. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and we have time for maybe one more since we're coming sort of to the top of the hour, uh, which I want to give to um, Dixon Benning, who's kind of asking for an encore. Uh, your book is a, a book of so many stories, um, and and uh, Dixon is asking for a particular story. Could you tell the story of bringing um, Eric Clapton from the UK, who was scheduled for a concert at Madison Square Garden and was delayed owing to illness? Right. Sure. So um, when George Harrison asked me to do the concert for Bangladesh for him, uh, we booked Madison Square Garden for August 1st. And then George quickly organized a band. And the band was Ringo Starr and Jim Keltner on drums and Klaus Foreman on bass. And Eric Clapton would play guitar and Billy Preston would play organ and Leon Russell would play piano. And so it was this great band. And we all agreed to meet a week before the concert to rehearse because they'd never played together. So we get, I booked Carnegie Rehearsal Hall and everyone shows up except there's no Eric Clapton. And so I send a message to Apple Corps in London, the Beatles company, and said, you know, go out to Eric's house and see what's going on. And they went out. And his girlfriend came out and said, oh, he's too sick to travel. Come back tomorrow. So they, they come back the next day. They change his re reservation. They come back the next day. Same deal. She comes out. He's too sick to travel. And uh, so for the third day, George says, well, I know what this means. He's, he's addicted. He's got heroin addiction. That's what his sickness is. And he doesn't want to travel. And so let's get another guitar player. So we found Jesse Ed Davis who worked for Taj Mahal and, and, and I sent a message to Apple. Okay, tell Eric, we don't need him anymore. We've got someone else. They said, oh no, he's coming, he's coming. So they get him on the plane and he's coming into JFK only was, I think it was still called Idlewild. No, 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 not by now. Not by now. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. So we come into JFK. No, no, it's, there's an international arrivals building. That's what, right. And George says, well, you go out and I'm sending this guy, Pete Bennett with you. And he's Alan Klein's fixer. He's the guy who knows everything. He's got the whole world wired. And he, he always comes and gets us off the plane when the Beatles come in. He gets the Rolling Stones off the plane and, and he, he's got it fired. So just stick with him. He said, only one thing, don't let him take a picture with Eric, okay? And so I, we go in and literally we go in the wrong way in the International Arrivals Building. We go through the doors that are supposed to be one way towards and we go right to the gate. And everyone knows him and he's got some special badge and everything. And we get, go right onto the first class section and there's Eric and his girlfriend. And Pete says, okay, come with me. And we go off the plane and we don't go down the ramp. We go off, off this little door and there's literally a car waiting down below on the tarmac. And it drives us to a little building and there's a guy there who checks his passport and that's it. And, and we, then we leave and, and Eric says, what the hell? He says, if I'd known that was it, I would have done something different here. I would have brought something with me, he said. <laughs> Pete Bennett with no idea what the fuck he was talking about. <laughs> so we get to New York and then of course, Eric needs to have a meeting with George immediately. And the meeting turns out, well, uh, I need to score, right? And Eric says, and George says, well, Phil Spector knows about this stuff. And Phil Spector was the record producer. So we'll get Phil Spector to find him some dope. And Phil Spector evidently found him some dope, but it was low quality as far as Eric and his girlfriend were concerned. And so so then someone said, oh, Sandy Bull. And so they found Sandy Bull. 
eventually we got him on stage, but he was so smacked out that when he had to play My Guitar Gently Weeps, he picked up the wrong guitar. He picked up this hollow body Gretsch, which is this huge big thing. It was great for playing rhythm guitar on, but it's not good for playing that solo on. It even has a different number of frets on it. Anyway, he, he was just out of it, but he made it through. And, and by the second concert, it was all okay. But it was, it was a, it put me off wanting to be, a, you know, touring with a heroin addict. That's for sure. <laughs> next stop, next stop, you know, Maurice Scorsese, right? Right. Exactly. Uh, you know, in all your stories, and also in the book, you strike this really remarkable balance, I think, between celebrating on the one hand but not romanticizing. You know, which I I think is. Um, is, is special in, in a memoir like yours. And uh, I, if we think about what we can maybe uh, take into our own moment as incommensurate as it may be with the 60s, and it couldn't be more incommensurate, uh, there you have, it seems, in all the phases of, of, of your book and your life, you, you have a sort of tolerance for, and maybe even appetite for the, for the unknown and the unpredictable, Another way of saying that is a kind of appetite for improvisation. And, and um, we're in such an anxious age and anxiety forecloses exactly those things, right? You, when you're anxious, you're not going to improvise. And, and so for, for me, part of what the book serves as is a reminder um, that, that we need to look for the spaces in which we can still um, be, be uh, welcoming the unknown in in it with an improvisational spirit. So, um, thank you for for that. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Like, yeah, it's a great book. Uh, find a copy. Um, uh, find one at Labyrinth LabyrinthBooks.com. Um, and we hope to see you at future events. Some are online, some are hybrid in the store. All of that is on the events page on our website as well. You can also check out past events on our YouTube channel and um, with your permission, I hope I have your permission, of course. Um, this one as well. So um, this has been really fun. Thank you so much. Thanks to all, all right. of you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Thank you, Seth. See you later, guys. Right. So long. Take care okay. and good night. Bye-bye.